Okay, let's go ahead and get started. My name's Kumar Venkateswar, and uh, my co-presenter is Kutlai Topatan, uh, and we're here to talk about search and exchange. So, what we're gonna talk about is the uh, search infrastructure, um, the index itself, how it's maintained, how information gets into the index, uh, the processes that are involved in, in search, how you monitor and, and manage those search processes, um, how we provide high availability with search, and how end user querying works uh, against that index. Um, how many people here are looking for information on, on e-discovery? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, I, I won't talk a whole lot about e-discovery because this is more focused on, on mail search. However, the indexing side of things, the full text index, is shared with eDiscovery. So the parts where I talk about uh, indexing architecture, that'll be uh, applicable, applicable to uh, eDiscovery uh, as well. So big picture, search is pretty simple. Um, you, you get messages uh, and, and other types of items, calendar and, and so on. They get indexed and they get stuck into the index when an end user queries for them. Uh, we retrieve the items and give them back to the end user. Of course, it's not always that simple a picture, and if you dig a little bit deeper, it gets a little more complicated. So let me start out with, uh, there's an item in storage, in, in the store, and we're looking to understand a little bit more about how the indexing of that works. So if we look at how uh, you immediately notice it's a little bit more complicated than that, that big picture. So when store gets an item uh, in, that's inserted into it through transport or, or other means, uh, it fires off a notification to the search service itself. And the search service collects those notifications together into uh, a batch of, of document IDs that it passes on to the content engine. Uh, content engine is, is one of those node runner processes that you might have seen. Uh, it, it, ta it, it takes that list of, of doc IDs and as it's processing them, it gets the information from store, pulls that information in, it does filtering, word breaking, and uh, content transformation into tokens that it puts into the index. Um, along with that, associated with the content engine node is a document parser. And that document parser is actually in a separate process, or could be in a separate process. There's certain document parsers that live within the node runner process itself, and there's some that live within another process called parser server, which you may have noticed. Um, and together, the two of them provide the requisite transformation of the content that you have in order to make it so that it can be uh, transformed into tokens that can be inserted into the index node. And that's how the information gets into the index. So the good part about this is it, it works pretty well. It's pretty reliable. Uh, Mappy notifications are, are reliable, and, and um, we can we can get this process working pretty seamlessly. Um, less good is, in this flow, you can't write back to the database, which means that if you process that information, uh, it has to be processed individually on each copy. So for instance, in, in uh, Exchange Online, there's four copies. Uh, we would need to process each one of those pieces of content four times. In addition to that, because this is a, a Mappy notification fired when the information is in store. It means that you also have to do per user processing because this is after DL expansion. So if information is sent to a DL and it gets delivered to each individual mailbox, each individual mailbox has a notification that has to get processed. So how do we, how do we address these problems? And it, the way to address them is to try and move some of this processing upstream. 
And we can do that before the information gets in the store. So there's a separate indexing flow that actually occurs in transport. And this happens upstream of the information getting in the store, and as a result of which it solves some of those per copy and per user problems that we had before. But at the same time, it has some other downsides that I'll, I'll get into. Um, the message goes to transport, and in the transport flow itself, that, inf that message gets passed off to Content Engine. And Content Engine is able to do that processing, uh, the, a similar processing that would be done in the mailbox flow. However, it actually writes that back to the, uh, sorry about that. Uh, it actually writes back to uh, store so that that information, that partially processed information, is available for each of the copies. So the good part about that is it's writing this metadata before message delivery actually happens, which means that you don't need to do the processing again per user or per copy. Uh, it also is able to write the natural language processing data that's used by uh, Outlook applications. And this is the stage at which uh, that happens as well. Um, less good, because it's in the transport flow and there are hard requirements around how quickly we can deliver within the transport flow, this is best effort processing. So what we do is we, we, we say, okay, if we can process this message in a certain amount of time, we'll do that, and we'll try and write that metadata, that partially processed information, out. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll give up and we'll pick it up again in the mailbox flow. And we're able to do that because you run both. The, um, the other thing uh, that uh, we've been looking at, and this is, this is something we're continually looking to improve, is the metadata itself. So if there's a way that we can move some, of, some more of the processing upstream so that it makes it easier uh, for, um, the, there's more, if we move more of the processing upstream, then we don't have to do as much processing per copy and per user. So we're looking at ways to improve that as well. So let's try and put the two together and try and look at how this looks uh, in terms of the whole indexing pipeline. So we have a, the message getting to transport. Transport passes it off to the content engine. And what we refer to this metadata is, the, the way we refer to it is the annotation stream. And what that annotation stream contains is it contains only the words to index. So if there's things like HTML content, we won't index the tags uh, because no end user is really going to search on the, um, on, on the tags of, of an HTML message, so there's no sense in indexing that. Um, we'll index, uh, we'll, we'll put in the information on word break boundaries, and because of the nature of what we're storing, this tends to be much smaller than the message itself, and we store it with the message as it goes to store. So because it's smaller, the information that gets passed from copy to copy is smaller than the full body itself. So we use that annotation stream writer to write back to the message that's in transport, and then that gets written to store. So what happens after that is uh, store fires a notification to the search service, uh, and the search service sends a batch of doc IDs over to the content engine. Content engine goes to store to look at the content, and if that annotation stream actually exists, then it picks it up with the annotation stream reader. If it doesn't exist at this point, then it will go through the full process of word breaking and, and content transformation that it did, uh, that I showed earlier. And then those tokens get put into the index node and written to the index. So I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. I've got this slide here as reference for the full uh, mailbox flow for those, uh, those people that need that information. But it basically describes each of the steps that we go through in terms of uh, changing the content that we see in the, in the mailbox into something that we put into the index. 
So the next thing I'd like to talk about is um, something uh, about the structure of the index on disk. So we've talked about how that information gets into the index, but the structure of the information uh, on disk itself is not something that we've touched on yet. So the index itself is a big uh, inverted index. It's stored in a tree and in multiple parts. Um, there's actually technically a couple of different uh, update groups, we, we call them. There's a couple of different trees. And the reason we do this is because most of the information doesn't change a whole lot after it's initially processed. So between transport and, and when it first gets into store, it doesn't change a whole lot. Um, where there's some information, in particular the folder, um, because of rules and, and uh, other user behaviors, folder tends to change a whole lot more. So what we've done is we've separated this out into two separate sections, one that gets updated relatively infrequently and one that gets updated relatively frequently so that when we go back to retrieve the content, we don't have to retrieve the full content, we just need to know the folder. So if it's a folder change, we'll only process the folder, we won't process the whole uh, item itself. Um, the on-disk uh, on uh, index parts have five levels plus a master index. So the way the index node actually writes this out to disk is it writes at the lowest level. There's an L, L0, a level zero that's in memory. And as that gets filled up, it writes uh, a level one index part to disk. And as, as you get three level one index parts, those get merged into a level two index part and so on and so on up to uh, level five and then a master. Um, each, each merge, so, so we refer to them as merges, they uh, occur when there are three of the lower level parts that are full. And in order to kind of keep this merge behavior at a, at a relatively constant baseline, we throttle it down to four simultaneous merges and uh, you know, one, one master merge occurring on an entire uh, server at any given time. So no matter the number of databases that you have, and we have individual index systems uh, uh, on, uh, on each server that correspond to the database, no matter how many of those that you have, uh, you'll have at most four simultaneous merges. And this way you don't have spikes from merging, you have a continuous hum, and the majority of, of that uh, resource consumption will come from uh, index node. Um, master merge is a, is a special merge. It occurs with 20% of the content outside of the master index. So we don't really look for uh, how the parts are full. Uh, we, we merge with 20% of the content outside. Um, this, again, is something that we're looking at for, uh, for future tuning. So the way that, that query works, it actually touches each of those parts. So uh, if there are a lot of parts, that means that we'll, we'll end up doing a lot more disk IOs for querying, which is undesirable. Um, we also are looking for ways to make it a little more efficient in terms of that continuous uh, merge uh, processing. So we want merges to occur, and we want them to occur uh, at, at a not too, not too often and, and not too rarely. So this is something that we're looking at as an area for uh, um, tuning. So let's go ahead and, and look at um, the messages and, and attachment processing. So messages themselves can be arbitrarily complex. Uh, you can have things like uh, message attachments within messages. You can have zip file attachments within messages. Uh, and as a result of with which you can have, you know, you can imagine 100 levels deep or, or, or so on. And that could cause the index system to take a lot of resources in order to process that. So in order to moderate that, we have a limit on the number of attachments that we'll process, and we have a limit on the depth that you'll, uh, you'll want to go through. And the formats are, uh, 
we, we support a certain set of formats, and I'll get into that uh, in the next slide, but if the nesting is too deep, then we won't process those attachments even if the formats are, uh, are supported. And this is configurable. The, uh, um, the reg key that's, that's there in order to configure it is listed. And we've seen that some administrators like to con configure that depending on the needs of their organizations. So we have um, one, one of the things that we, uh, um, we've done in, in 2013 is we're using the FAST engine. And the FAST engine has uh, enabled us to expand the list of, of supported formats. So we have a, a pretty reasonable set of supported formats that will index just out of the box. Um, as of SP1, we'll, we'll also pick up third-party AI filters and, and use them. However, in order for those third-party AI filters to be picked up and used, they actually have to be registered uh, using the uh, new, new search document format commandlet. But once that's, once that's done, um, that will be one of the, the list of messages that's, that's uh, um, handled by the parsers. And we will go through uh, a little bit during the demo about what it looks like if there's a message type that is not supported by a parser. So I know there was a, a, a question around what the node runners do. Uh, this, is, this is basically the list of the four different node runner processes. Uh, host controller uh, starts up the node runners. Host controller gets started up by the search service itself. And the host controller service starts up the four different node runners. The node runners are admin node, which provides uh, uh, administration of, of the, uh, the three other node runners. Content engine node is the, the node runner that provides that transformation of content from um, the, the messages that are in store into tokens that can be inserted into the index. Um, then the index node is what handles the on-disk index, and uh, both from an indexing perspective and for query, and interaction engine node is what handles query itself. Um, in addition to the four node runners, there may be up to, um, I believe in SP1, we changed it to one times the number of cores uh, parser servers. So you can have up to, uh, on a 12 core box, you can have 12 parser servers, and content engine actually spawns those up on an as needed basis in order to process certain document types. So we talked a little bit about uh, the processes. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, resource, resource consumption. I know this is uh, also something that, that people have asked questions about. Um, why, is, why is search taking so much in the way of resources? Um, the, the, the quick answer to that question is, what we've done in, in 2013 and will continue to do going forward is we're trying to make a trade-off between user experiences, the user experiences we'd like to light up, and the resources that get consumed. So in order to light up new search experiences and to make it easier for end users to search, we, we have to take a certain uh, amount of resources in order to deliver those experiences. Um, we, we will provide ways to uh, um, make that trade-off, and we'll also, uh, later on in the presentation, Kutlai will demo demonstrate some of those, uh, uh, those user experiences that we've lit up. So uh, on disk resources, the uh, per item index size is, is pretty small. It's about 10% of the per item database size. Uh, because of merges, we could end up using up to 20%. Of, uh, of the database size, so that's the space that you'd want to allow for the index to grow to. Uh, the I.O. itself, it's, it's relatively sequential, so it's, it's pretty light on the disks, because the way uh, the, way the I.O. works, it, it's appending all of the changes to the parts, and uh, then those parts get merged in. So pretty much all of the I.O., except for query I.O., is sequential. And in general, because of, uh, 
because of the way we want to uh, make queries faster, we want to reduce the I.O. in queries as well. So both of those work together to make the I.O. load relatively light. Uh, for memory, uh, rule of thumb is around 15% of, of RAM for search. Uh, I believe that's what's in the capacity planning work uh, spreadsheet, and, and that's the, the guidance uh, everyone should follow. Um, but somewhat more precisely, there's, there's actually a constant cache cost and a constant per index system cost. So uh, it scales by number of databases. So if there are more databases, there are more index systems and, and more RAM is used as a result. There's also a per item cost. And this per item cost is due to the structures that are stored in memory in order to have queries go quicker. And this is one of those trade-offs that I was referring to. Because we want queries to go quicker, and this is something that end users have asked for, um, we're making the trade-off by s storing these structures in memory for quick retrieval. Um, the CPU consumption, when new content is coming in, supposing there are lots of deliveries happen, happening or uh, moves going on, that tends to increase the amount of CPU that's cons consumed by the content engine node. And that tends to be variable depending on the rate and the size and the nature of the attachments. Um, things like complex PDFs or really large Excel attachments, they tend to consume a lot more CPU than just straight body messages and, and things like that. Merges also consume some CPU. And the merge CPU is in the index node runner process. So you'll see between the, um, the content engine and the index node, uh, node runner processes, they tend to consume the majority of the CPU that's consumed by node runner. Uh, interaction engine node and admin node tend to be uh, pretty light in terms of both memory and uh, CPU. Index node tends to be bigger in terms of memory, and content engine node is uh, on the order of a couple of gigabytes. It, it varies a bit depending on the number of index systems, but that's, um, that's the order uh, of, of how big it tends to be. So for managing, uh, managing search, it's, it's um, pretty much the same, uh, same commandlets as in 2010, although we're returning more information. So if you look at something like get mailbox database copy status, uh, it has a bunch of fields that, are, uh, that provide information on uh, the content engine uh, or the content index parameters. So uh, for instance, the, the example that I've shown uh, shows what it looks like when there's a seeding in, in progress. So you can see their content index seeding percent actually tells you how the seeding is progressing. Um, there's a few others that describe the, the backlog. So if there are items where the notifications have been fired and it's not yet processed by the search, uh, search system, those will be in the backlog. Um, you, can, you can check the uh, search health with uh, test ex exchange search. And uh, get failed content index documents is uh, another important way to understand uh, the list of documents that, are out, that have not succeeded in, in indexing. Um, one thing that's not listed here is get exchange diagnostic info. Um, get exchange diagnostic info on the uh, Microsoft.exchange.search service process. Uh, that also provides some useful information on, on the health of the system. We also have quite a few perf counters that you can use to understand the health of the system. Uh, items processed per second is, is uh, a popular one and tells, tells you how fast the items are being processed into the index. Uh, retriable items is another one. So if we are receive an error that we believe is a transient error, um, we'll try and retry that uh, up to, I believe, three times before we'll call that item failed. So this uh, retriable items table 
tends to grow if you have, um, for, for instance, if you're looking at a, a, a passive node that's not able to connect to the active node for the purposes of indexing, um, you'll tend to see that re retriable items grow. And there's other types of those uh, transient errors that also cause that retriable items counter to grow. Uh, another uh, important counter is the uh, age of last notification processed. So uh, age of last notification process tells you uh, how many seconds behind delivery your indexing is. So for instance, um, the, one of the key things that we look at uh, when, when we're looking at uh, Exchange Online, we look at how many, uh, what percentage of items are processed within 60 seconds of, of being delivered to the, uh, to the store. And that information comes from the age of last notification counter. Um, let's see. Uh, also, there's the uh, uh, failed items counter. So that's another one. If we have retried a, a few times, if we've retried three times, and we're still not able to process the, those items, we'll dump that over to the failed items table, and those won't be processed. They could be uh, because, again, because we don't have a filter to process those items. Uh, if there isn't a filter um, um, to process them, they'll end up in failed items. Um, if there are permanent errors of some sort, we won't process them. If an item takes uh, a, an unreasonably long amount of time, uh, I believe that is uh, on the order of 10 seconds or so. If we spend more than 10 seconds or so on a single item, um, we'll assume that we aren't able to process it, and it'll end up in, in failed items. So they, they could be things like, um, again, those complex PDF documents and uh, Excel documents are the things that come to mind because that's the thing we see most often. So let's talk a little bit about high availability for search. Um, we've built the high availability architecture around the HA architecture for Exchange. So the commandlets that you use, the way that you manage it, um, the way that failovers happen, all of that is basically integrated in with the uh, HA architecture. Uh, as, as a result, it's very similar to the HA architecture, and reads always happen from the active copy. Uh, I know this is something that uh, you guys have, have worried about in the past, uh, and we are working on ways to reduce the network usage of this uh, in, the, in the future and we, in, the, in, the next, in, in the next few uh, um, months or years, I, I'm not sure of the exact time frame of that, you will see reductions in network usage here. So let's talk about uh, copy selection and failovers and seeding. So how, how how does, the, how does this fit in with the HA architecture? Um, index health is a pretty important factor for best copy selection. It's actually second only to DB health. Um, we only look at index health itself. We don't look at backlog or, or failed items or, or other status, but healthy and, and crawling copies will be picked over copies that have failed indexes. So um, if we can find a healthy healthy database with a health, healthy uh, uh, index, that's the first one that we'll go to um, before any other factors. Search status can also trigger failovers. So not only is it a, a factor that's used to decide which copy to go to, uh, it's also used to determine whether a failover needs to happen. So if we have a, a disabled or, or failed and suspended index on the mounted, uh, in other words, at, at that point, there's a query outage, so users cannot query. Um, that would be a failover. Uh, if the index is suspended but the database is not, um, meaning that uh, you know, the, the database could be mounted as a passive or an active, but the index is not, is not mounted, that would cause um, a, a failover. Um, 
if we have a, a stalled seed. So one of the uh, characteristics of search is that you can actually seed the active copy. You don't need to fail over necessarily to, uh, um, to get the active to seed. Uh, if we have a solid, stall seed, we're not able to uh, uh, reseed, and restarting the services uh, doesn't help, then we'll try and fail over. And if, uh, if there are no results on query, so if the interaction engine node doesn't respond to, uh, to queries at all, then we'll, uh, we'll try and fail over as well. Um, seeding, since since the index node is, is smaller than the database, um, you know, roughly five, 10 to 20% uh, of the size at any uh, given time, uh, it takes much less time. So we use it to remedy a, a variety of index issues uh, on, on passives and actives. And, and because it takes less time than uh, seeding databases, we use it in circumstances more than we would use uh, database seeding because it's a, it's a somewhat quicker remedy than doing some other things like potentially catching up and re-indexing uh, a bunch of documents. Crawling itself takes an extensive period of time. Seeding is pretty short, so sometimes we'll choose to seed instead of recrawling. Um, we are also actively looking at ways that we can uh, um, fix things in place rather than seeding the entire, um, the, the entire index over the network. So let's, um, let's go back and, and look at the, the big picture. So we talked a bunch about indexing and how we get information into the, the index. The, the next part is query processing. How do we make sure that when an end user sends a query, that we process that and send back the correct information? So thankfully, this is a little less complicated than uh, the picture of indexing. And in some ways, it's by design. Because the more steps we have in the process, the, the more effort it takes and the longer it'll take. And what we're trying to design this pipeline for it, more than anything else, and this is based on end user, end user feedback, is speed. So the more steps we have, the uh, more handoffs there are, the more transformation there is. Uh, so in order to make it as fast as possible, we have as few steps as possible. And in fact, um, what, what Kotlai is demonstrating later, um, we actually, uh, will bypass store in, in the middle. Right now you see store in the middle that's, that's providing these, uh, um, these queries. In some cases, what we will do is middle tier will talk directly to interaction engine and in order to make those queries much faster. So the queries themselves are uh, composed of, of AQS, which is the query language that's used in Outlook and, and Windows plus query restrictions on top of that. And those get word broken and, and parsed and passed on to uh, store. And once, query, uh, once store, uh, store takes that set of information and does a query plan, and it decides which information should be passed to the interaction engine and which information is most efficiently processed in store. And the information that gets processed in store is uh, um, fondly referred to as TWR, that which is residual. And the information that gets passed on to interaction uh, engine is in fast query language, uh, or FQL. So that F FQL query gets passed on to interaction engine. Uh, it performs the parsing and, and uh, transformation again, sends it on to index node retrieves back the document IDs from, from index node and sends that list on to, to store. And the way the processing happens in store, uh, it, it creates a search folder and uses those document IDs to populate the contents of that search folder and then links those, uh, those document IDs to 
it, it actually links a subset of, of that set to the messages table. And that linking part of it is actually the part that, that takes um, a large amount of time. So we do it in, in chunks. Um, we do the first 50, and then we do a, a subsequent 200 in, uh, um, in, in the way we process in order to make sure that we're able to return the set of results back to the end user as quickly as possible. So one of the things that we, we mentioned here is word breaking. And um, the, one of the keys with word breaking is that it's language specific. Um, for instance, uh, users, uh, uh, administrators that have users that are using Chinese and, and Japanese, the word breaking is different between Chinese and Japanese. And that's something that um, makes things difficult because if you notice, there's word breaking on the query side and there's word breaking on the index side. And they both have to be identical in order for those queries to be returned. If we split the words wrong or differently in either side, we won't be able to retrieve the items that, that users are looking for. So this, again, is an area that we're actively working on. We're working on language detection. Uh, in the transport flow, we, we run the body through language detection in order to find the language. Uh, if for very short bodies, if it's uh, less than 12 characters, and, and that's something that's, that's common in Asian languages, but also does happen in, in non-Asian languages, um, we leave it blank. Because at that point, there's not enough content and we're not able to detect it. Um, if, if we don't detect it at that point, we try and use English and try and see if, if, uh, if we can get by with English. It's not the best. Uh, we, we're trying to figure out how to have a better default uh, at, at this stage. But right now, the way things are working, it, it's, uh, it uses English. In the mailbox flow, because we have access to a little bit more content and a little bit more time, we actually try and use uh, body and the subject and contacts in order to see if we can get up to that 12 characters and actually do a better job of detection. So it's more likely to succeed there as well. But again, the uh, fallback language is, is English if we can't figure out what language it is. And on the query side, we actually use mailbox session culture for language identification. So um, we, we try and make sure that we're as uh, intelligent about guessing uh, the, the language on both sides is possible, but this is uh, an area that we recognize there are opportunities for improvement, and we're working on, on um, making that better. So some of the common problems that we see in query troubleshooting, um, queries return a maximum of 250 results, and that's something that uh, we, we did this in order to improve the query performance. Um, Sometimes users have been used to looking through large numbers of, uh, of items, and um, it's, not, it, it's, it's something they're used to. And because of that, they want to continue doing it. But our, our strategy for this going forward, and you'll see this in, in, in Kotlai's demo, is we're trying to provide tools for users to narrow down the, sets, uh, the set of results returned in an intelligent fashion so that they're able to find the results they want. I mean, while users say they want to uh, they want to look through a bunch of results, I'm pretty sure no one's really happy looking through page after page of of results because it's it's not an efficient use of time. So our focus has been we'll try and get it so that we'll return 250 results as soon as possible, and we'll try and satisfy the the speed requirements, and then we'll try and provide tools that help end users sift through the information and make sure that they're getting that set of 250 results that contains the thing they're looking for. Uh, another thing that can, can cause issues is uh, indexing issues, whether it's transient or permanent. Um, uh, you know, complex attachments, things without filters installed, uh, if the IRM server is, is unavailable at the time, um, that's something that we've seen, and those cause um, queries to fail. So what I thought I would go ahead and, and do is uh, 
demo query troubleshooting. So imagine the, the scenario where um, an end user says, I've got this item in my mailbox, and I can't find it. Uh, I type in uh, words that are in the, in the body of the message, and it's just not coming up. So I'll, I'll go ahead and demo how we could step through that process of finding out what happened to that message. So let me switch over here. So one thing I'll say, this is, uh, uh, it's, it's always a risky demo when you try and inject failures in. And this is one of those cases where I'm gonna not only inject failures in in order to uh, make it stop indexing, but I'm also gonna restart the services. And sometimes they won't come up in the uh, uh, amount of time that we uh, have to do the demo. So, or in this particular case, it may not even want to connect. I'm also doing this off of a, a, a virtual machine, which is uh, also a bit more risky, but um, I tried to get them to allow me to inject failures into uh, production topology. They weren't really very enthusiastic about that either. I can't imagine why. Okay, so um, I guess I'm gonna have to go to my fallback. I do have a video that I've taken. I thought I might have demo issues uh, given, given the complexity of it, so I thought uh, <laughs> I can do better than that. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So I'm signing in as, uh, as the administrator here. And uh, as an administrator, I'm gonna go ahead and, and send an IRM protected message to the end user. And I did the, uh, um, the special test registry key in order to uh, turn off IRM processing. So when it goes through, You'll, you'll see that it doesn't get indexed, and it shows up in the failed, uh, in the failed items. So we've got a unique body word in, inside the message, and uh, uh, a, unique, a unique subject word uh, in, in the subject, both of which can be used to search for. So uh, if I go ahead and, and set permissions uh, to do not forward, it's now an IRM protected message and it'll be, um, uh, it'll be something that we won't be able to index if the, if the IRM server is down, or in this case, if we've turned off IRM processing. So um, I've gone ahead and, and uh, um, switched over to the, to the user account, and the user will see the uh, message from the administrator that's IRM protected. And we'll go ahead and try a search. And the search, because uh, the IRM server was down at, at the time, uh, it doesn't come up with any results, even though there is that one message that matches it. So we'll switch over. We'll sw switch over to the PowerShell window and try get failed content index documents for the user. Uh, in order to get the, that list of, of uh, failed documents. So one thing you'll notice, um, you can actually see the, the subject of that message itself. So not only can you see the list of, of messages, um, but you can see the specific subject, and you can see if that specific message 
uh, is in the failed documents table. So in order, to, um, in order to fix that, you can also see a little more information. Um, in order to fix that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, turn IRM processing uh, back on and restart the servers uh, in a minute. Let me see if I can skip ahead. Okay, so that's where I did the magic registry setting change uh, to re-enable uh, IRM processing, and I'm restarting, uh, restarting the service. So the two services to restart start are uh, host controller service and uh, the MS Exchange fast search uh, service. So that's something that you can do in order to solve some, um, some problems that, uh, um, that may come up. And shortly after this, I will demonstrate get exchange diagnostics info as well. Not there right after this. So that's the default output of uh, get exchange diagnostics info if you don't specify a process. Um, we have uh, uh, two, two ways to look at this info. You can look at uh, get all nodes info in order to uh, find out the state of the individual node runners. So you can see admin node says it's, says it's okay, content engine node says it's okay, interaction engine node says it's okay, and, and so does index. Neither. Uh, none of those report any, any errors, and uh, neither uh, will, um, will the search service itself. So um, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the content index state, um, when you restart the services, they, they come back as failed as a, as a default until the search service is able to understand uh, the state of uh, of each of them and verify that the state of each of those nodes is up. So even when the content index state uh, is reporting failed, it may be able to satis continue to satisfy queries. Let me go ahead and move forward again a little bit. So the next thing that we do, um, once, once we know that, that uh, service has been, the indexing service has been restored, we can move the user's mailbox. And when we move the user's mailbox, that actually goes through the same type of process that uh, transport processing goes through. So um, the, uh, the migration service will hand over the messages to Content Engine, and while it's writing that information into store, it'll actually re-index the content and reword break and put that information in as it's doing the migration. So when the migration is complete and, and it gets finalized, at that point, not only is the content moved over, but the end user should be able to execute searches. Uh, so we do these things in, order, in, in parallel in order to make sure that once, a, once the mailbox is moved, they're able to have full service on that mailbox. And we can probably skip the move itself. So the move's complete, and at this point, the end user should be able to uh, execute a, a, a search. So um, we, we do have some caching on, on the client side in terms of search information. So um, we, sign, we sign out and sign back in in order to clear that cache. And now the end user should be able to search for the same term 
and find that result. So there you see it comes up. So um, now, now that we've, demo, we've uh, seen a little bit of, uh, um, of what the architecture looks like and I've touched on a few points about how we're improving it, um, Kutlai will go ahead and, and show you what's new in Office 365 mail search and provide a bit of a preview of some of the things that we'd like to deliver on for on-premises in the next release as well. Thank you, Kumar. Hi, uh, my name is Kutlai, and I'm a PM in OWA team. And today I'll be talking about some improvements that we're making to the OWA mail search experience. And um, so before we go into what those improvements are, let's start with some numbers. So by the time this talk is over, from the beginning, uh, there will be 4.5 billion messages, business messages, sent around the world. And these are not consumer messages, just business mails. And if you think about the 50 gigabyte mailbox that we give to Office 365 users, and making some assumptions about message size, message size um, a user does not have to delete any mail for the next 93 years, and their mailbox will still not be full. So uh, given this large mailbox sizes and the amount of information that we receive, search is one of the key components of, a, of how users find their information and be productive, such that um, based on a McKinsey report, um, users spend 20, information workers spend 20% of their time searching and gathering information. So, um, the software products, whether they are served over the web or running on your devices, um, have introduced new search capabilities over the years. And um, search engines like Bing and Google are good examples to this. Um, some of the features they have introduced are um, suggestions, uh, which give the user some entry point to find what they are looking for. Um, second one is very fast results. If you look in the Google search results today, they will tell you at the top, and most of the time, search results are coming under a second before if the user even has time to realize that something has gone on. And the third one is what we call refiners or filters, which are relevant to the results that you get back from, those, from that search. So what I mean by relevant is that you get a certain type of results, and you have some refiners that goes along with those results so that you can narrow down on the, on the results that you're getting. Um, so coming back to mail search, we looked at some quantitative data of how our users are searching. And we found that almost one third of all the searches are repeat searches. And what, is, what does that mean? That means about 30% of the time, a user is starting some search, getting back some results, looking through them, not finding what they're looking for, and then canceling out and starting again. So that means that's a failure for us. And when we looked at some qualitative data as well, so when we talked to our users, we gathered and summarized some of the pain points that they're experiencing. Uh, with search. And the first one of those was that mail search is way too slow. And if you compare it to the, the web search queries, yes, it is slow today. 
Um, second, find, second one is that when they get back some results and uh, they're trying to find the information within those results, they have to scroll through and they don't have the necessary tools to narrow down to the exact few that they were looking for. So they don't have the refine, refiner experience that they see other places. Um, third one is pre-organizing. So setting up folders and then meticulously moving items in the folders beforehand to find stuff later is not really um, productive for the users. Even though they do this, their search success time is not really increasing because they still need to remember where they have put that item and then they have to go back and scroll through the list of things in there. So they're, although they are doing this upfront work, it's not really helping them find it quicker. And the last thing is it's hard for them to recall what they're going to start their search with. So they have some idea of what they're going to start with, but um, they don't know the exact terms, so, so suggestions can help here. So what are we go doing in mail search, or a mail search today, to help alleviate some of these pain points? Um, first of them is lightning search results. But that's what we call them. Um, so as Kumar explained, thanks to our new query and indexing pipeline, um, our goal is to serve search results to the users under one second. And um, the second one is what we call personalized suggestions that help interpret users' intentions when they're starting it. So based on some, um, based on mailbox content, search history, uh, recipient cache, and things like that, we strive to give the users the best suggestions so that they can start their, uh, that can start and end their search in the most successful way. Um, third one is content-based refiners. I don't know if you remember from the previous, uh, the current version of OWA, but we have some static refiners that goes along with mail search. Gives you this folder, the whole mailbox, or this folder and subfolders, and a few uh, date refiners that are, that are pretty static. So what we are doing in mail search now is along with your result set, we're giving you content-based refiners that um, help you find and narrow down the results quicker. And the last one is what we call head highlighting. This is, um, this is the first time it's done in a, any mail search experience. And uh, this helps you find relevant sections that you were looking for within, within, a longer, within a longer conversation. So that's enough talk about some end user features. And I'm going to switch to a demo. I hope I'm luckier than Kumar because I don't have a backup. Okay, so I am in the new um, OWA mail search experience, and I'm looking for some information, some mails that I received from Robin Counts. Um, but I have a few people named Robin Counts that I interact with. So the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I got the person who I'm going to search from correct, and then do a search with that person as the from line. Um, so as I start typing her, the beginning of her last name, I see that there are some suggestions in there. And the first few ones are the keywords. And you can see with an icon on next to them that they are coming from your search history. And at the, at the uh, bottom section of it, there's what we call the from refiners. 
And if you click on the icon next to here, I can get the contact information for Robin here. And now that I have confirmed that I got the right person, I want to find all the emails um, from her. So I launched the search, and I got all the results from Robin here. I don't know if you realize how, that, how quick that was, but that was probably close to a second. Uh, that uh, every time I click on the search, actually it goes back to the server and comes back. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look for all the emails with the keyword contents in it. Again, I start typing, select one of the suggestions, and uh, launch the search. Now, if you look under the search box over here, we got these new dynamic content-based refiners. At the top, you see the from refiner, in the folders refiner, attachments refiner, and the date refiners. So the from refiner, is what, the, what this tells you is that it shows you all the people who have sent you email with some content, with, with the keyword content in it. So if I click on Pavel here, it gives me back all the emails with the keyword content in it from Pavel. And if I want to further narrow down and find only the ones from Pavel in the content analysis folder, I can just easily do that. And if I want to see from everyone again, I can click on Pavel, and it goes back to the list of all the people that has sent me. And if you've seen it, if I unselect this content analysis folder, it gives me back all the folders that has that, the emails with the word um, content in it. The next thing I want to do is, actually, I want to find emails from Sarah with the word content, but only those that has attachments in it. So this is a new refiner that we have added. Um, I, when I click on Sarah, and I, when I say with attachments, it filters it down to all the ones that have attachments to it, if you can see both of them have attachment icons with it. And if I go back, and the last thing I want to show is the hit highlighting feature that we have. So I want, I'm looking for something. Again, I'm going to all the emails from Robin with the word content. And the second one seems like the um, seems like the one I'm looking for, but I don't know which section that I should need to be looking in that because there are a lot of them in the conversation here. So using this head highlighting feature here, I can go through the email and then try to find the relevant section where I'm looking for with the keyword content. So. So some additional details about this. Um, availability, the hit highlighting, which I showed last, um, is available to our uh, users today. Um, it has been for a while, actually about since summer, I would say, to our service customers and uh, on-prem with the latest release. Um, lightning search, dynamic refiners, and suggestions um, will be available to service customers first in uh, Q2 of 2014, and to on-prem customers with our next release. So suggestions, um, we have keyword suggestions that are populated from your mailbox content and your um, search history. We have some from refiners, people suggestions, what we call them. Um, it's a combination of your recipient cache and then we backfill from your directory of people. And the suggestions work such that if you're in your sent item folders, uh, we are smart about it and detect that you're probably looking for emails you sent to somebody, not from somebody, because all the emails in your sent items is sent by you. And so we switch that. Um, filter or uh, suggestion to a two refiner so that you can easily find uh, emails that you sent to some people. And as we're doing this, as we're learning and we're getting some feedback, 
uh, we're looking into other suggestion types that we can include here. Um, refiners, um, we got the from refiners, and depending on which folder you're in, if you're in sent items, it switches to a two refiner. Um, we have the from and two refiners. Um, we have the folder refiners, which help you find if you have a bunch of folders, if you can narrow down to a, the specific folder you want, rather than first selecting the folder and then doing the search. And the attachments one, which comes very handy if you're looking for that special document or the presentation that you're looking from a certain person, and date refiners. And um, again, similar to suggestions, uh, we are looking into other categories which might be helpful for users uh, to refine their result set. Um, that's the uh, end of our session. So I would like to invite Kumar back up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to come up. There, I think there are some microphones over there. We can, I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hardly hear it. Hello? Yeah, that's better. Right. Well, I heard there are some uh, problems in uh, performance policy in indexing uh, uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean languages. Uh, are you aware of this one? Problems uh, I'm, I'm actually not sure. Did, did you say, could you repeat that? You said there are performance issues in certain Indexing. languages? Yeah, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. Ah, yes, yes. So, so that was, uh, that's one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm aware of. Um, the problems come down to language detection. Um, we do have some fixes that are in the works and some fixes that are um, um, a, li a little further out. But that's an area that we're aware that there are issues and are actively working on. Um, my expectation and hope is that we'll have fixes for some of those things soon. And uh, we'll have complete fixes in, in the longer term. But that's an area we're well aware that there are issues. Uh, in our detection and word breaking. Uh, is it 2010 as well? Um, I am not aware of issues with 2010. It's, it's the uh, issues that I'm aware of are, are specific to 2013, but um, there may be issues in 2010 as well that are similar. Yeah, um, we still support in the OVA mail search, we still support all the um, keywords that we support previously. So that's there. Uh, we looked into um, like supporting an advanced search box, but we're first making sure the mainline cases, the, you know, the 18%, 90% of the searches are really quick and useful then because advanced searches are really useful in some cases where you cannot find some stuff, but they're used less often by most users. So we're, we're, we're looking into it, but we haven't yet invested in that. Yeah. No, I understand this being fixed, but things like especially the end user type trunk, colon, quote, and some of the names, actually for an end user actually know to do that, So, so that's one of the reasons we've uh, introduced uh, these refiners as, as they exist within the, in the GUI um, in order to make it so that no one needs to type in from colon and, and so on. Even the advanced search dialog was probably not the most efficient way for an end user uh, to do that. 
So, um, you know, what we showed right now is in OA. Our expectation is that future versions of Outlook will also incorporate some of the learnings that we have and uh, include uh, things like refiners that will allow uh, end users to narrow down the searches. So if you type in a keyword and you say, you know what, I, I actually wanted only the emails from Robin Counts. So then you can click on Robin Counts, narrow it down to that. Um, there's also, uh, although Kotlai didn't, uh, didn't demo it specifically, there was a set of date refiners as well. So it was, you know, is it older last week, older than one month, older than, um, what was it? Um, I can't remember the exact refiners, yeah. but there are, are, are date refiners as well. So the idea is that the advanced syntax works. You can type in a full AQS query into the search box, and that'll work. But our expectation is not that people would be doing that. People would be able to select that um, from, from the GUI. Um, the other thing around that is, as we move towards touch interfaces, um, the advanced search dialog as it, as it exists in Outlook today is not really very friendly for a touch interface. Um, the refiners, uh, particularly dynamic refiners, are much more friendlier to that. So that's, that's the way we'd like to go in order to solve that problem. Um, l let me add one more piece. So we're trying to um, remove users typing the most common ones, like from refiners. If you have seen in the suggestions, just selecting a user's name from the suggestion box will automatically launch a from refiner. And we want to make some UI enhancements so that they don't even see that from keywords anymore. But that's still a little bit, for the most of the users, that's still a little bit too geeky, too SQL-like, that kind of. So that we're trying to remove that one by one. That was the first iteration of how we tried to get there by clicking on the person's name. Automatically it does a from rather than you trying to type from. And as, as we get to the simplest case, then we'll look into what the advanced cases needs. Mm -hmm. Are you, uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is it capable of searching uh, numbers or characters within a word or numbers? For instance, you know, if you have numbers 1 through 10, I only want to look for, you know, I want to look for 2, 3, 4 you know, from 1 through 10. Is it, do you search things like that, like refining? Uh, are, you, are you thinking about search ranges, like? Any number from two to four, or are you thinking about uh, a substring type of search? Substring. So the the types of searches that we support we support prefix searching. So if you type in the beginning of a word, uh, it will pick all of the words that complete that. So if you type C O N, it'll get conference and content and and so on. Um, if you type in the middle of the word, uh, it won't. It, it won't expand out to, to get the full word. And, and the reason for that is most, most of the time when, when end users do search that we found, um, they tend to remember the beginnings of the words yeah. and not necessarily search for the middle. Got it. Um, we, we will look at ways that we can address that. And, and we know that's something that we've, we've heard a few times. But for the most part, we haven't seen um, um, uh, end users looking for that type of search. Uh, the way we'll probably try and address that is um, to try and make the searches themselves a little less exact and a little more fuzzy to uh, try and pick, pick that, uh, that case up. So um, I think we're out of uh, time, but I'm happy to stick around uh, for, for a few questions if, if you guys yeah. have them. Thank you guys very much.